Well, happy 4th of July to everyone who listens to the Cultivate podcast. We are not having a normal episode today where Brad and I get together to discuss various topics. We've been walking through Aaron Wren's book, Life in the Negative World, and that's going to pick back up next week. But we will have a couple other breaks sporadically throughout this. I am going to be out of the country one week this month and then also going to be in two weeks at a conference with Brad in Birmingham. And so that week's episode will be, if all things go according to plan, a bit of a recap with Brad, myself, and Sean joining us again to just kind of discuss takeaways from the conference. We're going to try to record either while we're driving back, because that would be fun, or in uh, our hotel as we wrap everything up with that. But wanted to jump on today to talk about uh, just something adjacent to life in the negative world. Probably one of the best books that I've read this year has been Joe Rigney's Leadership and Emotional Sabotage. And we're probably going to have a podcast series walking through this book on the whole at some point down the road. But I wanted to take a moment and talk about the problem that he identifies and takes from psychologist Edwin Friedman on an anxious society and kind of the reasons why we have such a chronically anxious and agitated society right now. He says there's five things that lead to this. It's One, reactivity, an unending cycle of intense reactions of members in society to each other and to events that take place in our world. The second thing is a process called hurting, where togetherness triumphs over individuality and everyone adapts to the least mature members of the community. He says the cycle of reactivity leads institutions to live in a constant state of tension and then the goal becomes peace at all costs and so you don't want to rock the boat you don't want to create problems and so you start to get people to herd together in these small collectives of what really becomes dispossessed and agitated folks now I don't want to discount the importance of being a part of a community and I don't think that's what Friedman's getting out when he says togetherness as an issue it's really that idea not of a communal good but of a kind of togetherness that prioritizes communal grievance as opposed to uh, the things that actually build up and strengthen a community the third thing is that blame starts to get displaced an emotional state is uh, developed in which members of the community focus on forces that have victimized them rather than taking responsibility for their own being and destiny. The fourth thing is that as all of this is taking place, you start to look for quick fixes. Quick fix mentality is this desire for symptom relief rather than a way to seek fundamental change, reformation, And it flows out of having a low threshold for pain. And the fifth thing is a failure of nerve. It's a lack of maturity, decisive leadership. Leaders are bombarded by interest groups and agitators, and thus they're constantly taken off mission. An emphatic paralysis sets in as everybody seeks to appease the most reactive members. So what's the solution to this? Rigney points to, among other things, I think this is his chief point that he wants to make, is that what the Bible would call us to to address these things is sober-mindedness. It's this ability to think clearly in spite of the chaos and the things that are happening around us. It's the ability to have your head and your wits about you in the middle of the chaos, And the reason I think this is so adjacent to this conversation of resilience that we had last week is because if you're going to withstand, if you're going to be able to be resilient, you're going to have to be sober-minded. You're going to have to be able to think clearly and decisively. 
Rigney says, if we live amidst raging anxiety storms and reactive social stampedes, the fundamental virtue leaders need is sober-mindedness. Now, when we think about soberness, about being sober, we're, we're thinking often about drunkenness, right? Drunkenness involves the impairment of our physical abilities as well as the impairment of our mental abilities and moral judgments. And we think this often as it relates to substance use, whether it's drinking alcohol or using some other kind of barbiturate or narcotic. But here's the the crucial truth, Rigney says. We can be drunk on more than alcohol. He says, think of the way that anxiety or anger can cloud your vision, your passions, emotions, and reactions rise and fall violently so that your judgment is impaired. The passions and reactions of others can be so intense that you can't see clearly as a result. And you're tossed about. You're moved back and forth. You aren't steady and stable. You aren't able to stand. You aren't able to withstand. Therefore, you are not resilient. Our passions are oftentimes the thing that drives our decision making. And when we are driven, by our passions, we are not being sober-minded. And the scripture calls us to that as Christians. It calls anyone who would aspire to leadership and aspire to uh, even be an elder to be able to regulate our passions because we're called to be sober-minded, self-controlled. When we're led by our passions, we tend to blow up or we shut down. We get aggressive or we become passive aggressive. We want to cultivate a kind of life that is rooted in sober mindedness so that we are not driven and tossed by the things around us. So we're not reactive. So we're not completely and totally shaped by what everyone around us is doing, herded into. these predictable patterns. We, we want to be able to own our own mistakes and own our own failures and not shift blame and displace it from ourselves to someone else. We, we want to find solutions that are long-term and not quick fixes. And we don't want to be people who have a failure of nerve. So I'll wrap this short episode up with this. Uh, Rigney's definition of what sober-mindedness is. He says sober-mindedness includes at least three elements. The first is clarity of mind. He says our passions act like fog. Anger, fear, pity, and desire distort our vision so that we don't see clearly. But when we're sober-minded, our vision isn't clouded. To be sober-minded is to be awake and alert. It's to have a sharpness to our vision. The second thing he says is that stability of soul marks those who are sober-minded. We're not easily tossed. We're steady. If you're sober-minded, you keep your head. You don't panic. You don't overreact. There's a ballast to your boat that weathers the storms that toss the ship. And the third thing he says is that sober-minded folks have a readiness to act. The sober-minded still feel deeply and rightly about reality, but because they keep their head, they act with purpose. They don't react. They respond. May we cultivate that kind of life, that kind of sober-mindedness in the midst of a world that is constantly wanting us to be drunk on our passions and desires. Well, hey, thank you for listening to this short episode of the Cultivate Podcast. We produce this podcast primarily for our partners at Mercy View to help them continue to grow in their love for Jesus, His church, and one another. If you're listening and don't attend Mercy View, thank you for tuning in. And if you're in the Tulsa area and you don't have a church home, we would love to have you join us this Sunday at 1030 a.m. But until next time when we return to Aaron Wren's book, we will see you later.